this. This punch card could be a portrait of you and your family. A portrait owned and manipulated by an all-powerful Big Brother government. And you work four whole months a year to pay Big Brother here in Washington to plan and regulate your life, your business, the teaching of your children, your protection, and even comfort you on the way to your final reward. There are many people to whom it is a frightening picture, and this man speaks for them. We must take a first step toward ending in our time the erosion of individual worth and responsibility by a growing federal bureaucracy. Most people who came from the old right like I did were against the federal government root and branch at all times. Later I began to understand that there are other institutions that play similar roles that I just didn't know about then. Now I know about them, I dislike them just as much as the federal government, the big corporations, the big universities. Any institution that exercises power over people in an arbitrary way so that people are not responsible for their own actions but instead become simply the players in someone else's scenario. In the early 1960s, Carl Hess was a major influence on the Republican right. By 1964, he stood at the threshold of political power, but no one could have predicted the changes the 60s would bring. Carl Hess was born in 1923 on his father's plantation in the Philippines. He was raised by his mother in Washington, D.C. An avid reader, Hess finished H.G. Wells' Outline of History before kindergarten. At 14, he wrote news copy for Mutual Radio. By his 28th birthday, he was press editor for Newsweek magazine. Hess's career took a decidedly ideological turn. Co-founder of the National Review, lifetime member of the National Rifle Association, he wrote for virtually every major conservative politician in Washington. In 1964, Hess joined the Goldwater presidential campaign as chief speechwriter. Goldwater referred to Hess as his Shakespeare. Their relationship was warm and personal. In his acceptance speech, Goldwater strikes a responsive chord in the hearts and minds of Americans across the country when he says... We must and we shall set the tides running again in the cause of freedom. I used to like to think that a ghostwriter was just a craftsman and uh, just took uh, ideas and uh, put them together in, in nicely packaged form, but there's more to it than that. Inescapably, the crafting of the speech makes emphases in the speech, uh, makes subtle changes in the idea so that the ghostwriter is a central participant in the political statement. When you're involved in the presidential campaign, you're really a part of the ruling class. But it's the jet set life. It's one that puts a premium on hard drinking, quickie love affairs, good appearance, imagery, sharp talk, fast talk. It is a mad, hectic thing. And people who expect sense out of it are stark staring mad. Henry Thompson says it's like uh, a moose in heat. It's just people crashing through the landscape, insanely anxious to get to their goal. It is a vast combat. All you want to do is win, 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 win. Say anything, do anything, just win, win. I'm Raymond Massey. Senator Goldwater needs and deserves your help. Please send your contributions to TV for Goldwater Miller, Box 80, Los Angeles 51, California. Let me repeat that. TV. The 64 campaign was a disaster in, in many ways. And one way was that all of the people who were loyal to Goldwater were pretty much drummed out of the party, for, at least for a time. In order to remain in the Republican Party, you pretty much had to denounce him. And I wouldn't say that I was overflowing with principle at the time, but at least I had enough to not go around denouncing my friends. So there I am kind of stuck for the first time in my life. 
as I look around for what I'm going to do, I feel less and less inclination to talk to my traditional friends about my future. So I was kicked out of a position of power. And from that vantage point, I could begin to despise power. One of the most personal experiences of power that you can have, that anyone can have, is riding in an official limousine. Whenever that happens, you find that you're looking out the window at a world that is frozen. Everybody is frozen because they're moving slowly and you're moving fast. And it's as though they're all dead and you're alive. And that power is sweeping the street clear in front of you. And the great events are awaiting your arrival. And then you begin, at least in my case, which I don't really think crazier than anybody else's, you begin to look at yourself as a separate entity and you admire your hand on the velour seat and you look at your, your shoes and admire the, the fine leather. But there's stuff beyond that, too, this class deference that you get when you begin to have power of any sort, like barbers coming to you, that's economic power. The reason you demand it stems from the notion that you have suddenly become so important that your every minute counts. Most politicians or other managers have very little to offer the world except their time. After 64, although I was still working for Senator Goldwater and writing his column, I became a commercial welder. And I can recall times when I'd leave a welding job, dash home, clean up, and go to a presidential press conference. While I worked for Goldwater, the world in which I lived was very upward mobile. It wasn't rich, but it spent a lot. People defined their lives by the elegance of their possessions, like old John down the street who has the Cadillac, as opposed to old Charlie up the street who's got a Buick. And so men become automobiles, and women become hostesses and are often defined in terms of what kind of parties they give. Then they send the kids out to do gladiatorial combat called the Little League. My lapse from suburbia began with a motorcycle. When I drove through my suburban neighborhood, you would have thought that Hell's Angels was invading the place. People just really thought that I was demented, I suppose. After having been such a dependable uh, middle-class person to my, my former wife, I was suddenly sort of a nut. I mean, my wife had no reason to think that life should change that rapidly. So I guess she watched in real horror as I uh, went downhill, uh, working with my hands, uh, riding a motorcycle, having curious friends. The people I start being thrown in with are a motley crew, let me tell you. <laughs> Just all sorts of... Uh, strange people who I would have described months before as perverts, bums, and subversives. Running for Goldwater and being a member of SDS at the same time was very interesting because we'd talk about those things that the old right and the new left had in common. Isolationism, the opposition to central political authority, genuine concern for people as individuals. Right after the 64 campaign, the Internal Revenue Service went into its uh, quadrennial song and dance of uh, auditing and otherwise harassing everybody who lost. One of the worst things about losing a presidential campaign is they get you. I went through an experience with them that I, I found sort of unbelievable. And I got to thinking, and I got angry. I read the Declaration of Independence while I was angry. And I sent them a copy, and I said, this document calls to my attention the fact that when you guys exceed all of your authority, be begin acting like a bunch of, of, of colonial troops, that I should abolish you. And so I said, I hereby abolish you. I won't pay your taxes anymore. Well, they don't think that's very funny. 
and they certainly have no interest in the historic significance of the statement. One thing about being dispossessed of, of, of income and possessions is that you, you begin to understand that there's a difference between money and the economy, or an economy. Money may be part of an economy, but it's not the whole thing. An economy involves exchanges of goods and services, and that means barter. Well, I got into welding for practical reasons, really. I had to have a marketable skill after I knew I was leaving politics. Transition was very easy. Uh, skills and crafts are very pleasant. From the first time I started, I really liked it. I liked the colors, I liked the sound, I liked the smell of it even. The, the thing about welding that was extraordinary for me was it was the first time I had ever met the enemy. I had always been under the impression, because all of my friends were, that working people were the enemy, literally the enemy. They were greedy and uh, they didn't know anything. They were just a bother. Of course, they did everything, but I can't understand why there is supposed to be uh, some sort of great uh, class distinction between uh, doing this kind of work, welding, between writing or things of that sort, because it's useful. I, I wish I could think all my writing was that useful. Now, the, the usual political uh, diagram is a circle, and as you come around the circle, right and left meet. And the political scientists are always talking about people like me. They say, oh, he's come around the circle, and the left and the right were always the same. That's a demented idea. The way these positions work out is a straight line. Way over on one side, you have authoritarian institutions. Way over on the other side, you have liberty. And when I was a Republican, I was part way there. And when I worked with the new left, I think I was a little farther. My position now, <laughs> it was about, I think it's about as far as you can go. I'm sure that you could say that I've committed every political error that is possible to commit. Uh, but there's one I haven't, and I'm proud to say that I haven't, and that is that I am not now, nor have I ever been, a liberal. The Democrats or liberals think that everybody is stupid, and therefore they need somebody from one of the schools within two or three miles of here to tell them how to behave themselves. Republicans don't think everybody's stupid, but they think everybody is lazy. Therefore, they require the police force and corporate law to make them get up and go to work. If there's anything that horrifies a Republican is seeing somebody with an illicit smile. Because somebody going around with this illicit smile, you don't know what they're up to, but one thing you know is they're not working hard enough. There's the Eastern statement, if you meet Buddha on the road, you should kill him. What I hope that means is that if you meet someone on the road of life who attempts to substitute for your thinking and your living your own life, that you should push that person aside. One example of the, the stupidity of big institutions is the concept of gross national product. Suppose you have a traffic accident. The car is all smashed up. Somebody has to haul it away. Up goes the gross national product. There's blood on the pavement. You have to sweep it up. Up goes the GNP. You have to replace the car. Boom! Up it goes more. Now you've got some poor person that has to either go to an undertaker or a hospital. More GNP. When I get to be president, <laughs> I'm going to call in the Chemical Warfare Service and say, look, we need some quick progress around, so let's have the bubonic plague. <laughs> See, because the gross national product is going to go right through the ceiling of that. Well, the central authority has just embedded right in it uh, 
its own problem, and that is that it means a few people make decisions for many people. One thing means that their mistakes ramify, their mistakes spread out and affect everybody. They issue orders to the people below them in ways that will support not a project or a creative effort, but will support their power. So that you have a general level of incompetence as engineers, designers begin to pay more attention to their advancement in the party or the corporation than to the actual uh, craft of their work. Another thing is that it means that they get to be active and principal people. And everybody else gets to follow orders at best. Most people on the face of the earth, if they want anything else, they want to feel significant, as though they're alive and that somebody cares about them. We may be a planetary species, but every one of us in that species is an odd bull. The ideological revolutions, the kind that we've mostly had lately, have as their purpose to seize power. It occurs to me that the really American revolution would be to destroy power. See, I don't think of society as some big thing. Society is people together making culture. And I think the most crucial part of all the considerations about social matters is scale. Society, in fact, is neighborhoods. And I think it should be that in practice. The perspective of a, of a neighborhood is really amazing. In that perspective, you can take the most horrible things and see them in a new and much less horrifying light. Hitler in a neighborhood is a bully. Hitler, as head of the Federal Republic of Germany, elected official, is a horror. There is a point in the scale of social organization beyond which the purposes and the practices of the people involved cannot be reflected. The sort of society that I think of when I think of a free and democratic one is first of all one in which everyone is responsible for their own actions. That's a beginning point. The second thing is where they have opportunity to participate in all the decisions that affect their lives, not to select someone else to do it for them. And when you start out by saying, people should be responsible for the development of their own technology, you're suggesting people living in a way entirely different from the way they live today, which is as consumers. You're suggesting that they live as producers as well. Now, imagining a society like that, you can't really imagine that the important matter of tools, of how you grow things, build things, could be let go. I mean, you simply can't have a society that is democratic in its politics and not democratic in its industry and its technology. Well, solar energy has a, a very broad implication. It falls over the entire Earth. It's very decentralized. If energy can be picked up from any point on the Earth, it sort of suggests to you that you don't need central mechanisms, that you can produce important things at a local level. Nuclear energy suggests that you have to have big central organizations. So you're having these two sources of energy, the summing up of the major political debate of our time. Can people be free in a decentralized and democratic way, or do they have to be regimented on behalf of big central organizations? Nuclear says regiment, the sun says freedom. Today, more and more people want to live in a more independent, self-reliant, less institutional way. The kind of tools and techniques that are chosen to support that way of life have been given the name alternative or appropriate technology. If you have a free society, the tools and techniques appropriate to that will be of a certain kind.
Not a certain kind in the sense that there'll be high technology or low technology, but be a certain kind in the sense that they can be developed and deployed and maintained by the people involved, so that just as their, their politics is participatory, so is their material base. Some people think appropriate technology means making your own candles and uh, wearing a lot of beads and saying wow a lot. It would seem to me it's the other way around. Appropriate technology means that you've got to know more than all those people at MIT. They can make a gadget that is just plain dumb, and there's always General Motors in the U.S. government to support it. technologist has got to make things that are elegant, really smart, that really work. Before working on the house, I had an idea that metal was the only thing I could work with because the most delicate instrument I could handle was an eight-pound sledge. After doing this, I feel that it just bears out what I've often thought. Most people can do anything if they put their minds to it and study a few basic principles. The whole house is an appropriate technology. It reflects exactly the way uh, Therese and I want to live. Uh, we designed it and built it. The whole thing was uh, low in cost because we have no money. Rather than being rigid and saying nature must conform to us, we let available materials determine some of the design. It's a fairly self-sustaining house. It's a passive solar system. It heats itself all day long in the wintertime. It has a wood stove to heat at night. The choice of wood as a backup heat was fairly natural. There is wood available. It's rather low in cost, at least at this point, and the equipment is very low in cost. We have neighbors whose uh, cost of heating for a month is twice as much as our heating for an entire year. The total cost of the house, well, it's less than a big executive automobile, considerably less than that. And the reason, of course, is that it was a labor-intensive house. But we can't build automobiles. If anybody says that I'm a, a leader in alternative technologies, I would tell them they're, they're absolutely wrong. I'm neither a leader nor a follower. I'm a practitioner. And all of the people I know who are involved in this take it as one of the most important points that there are no leaders, only practitioners. And the point is you can. My teaching, if it is indeed teaching, is about an attitude is called beginner's mind. What it means simply is approaching every problem open, like a child, uh, with no preconceptions, trying to understand the problem wholly, and then using the entire universe of knowledge uh, for the answer. The world demands of people that they know more, not less, about their entire environment. And the, the environment isn't just trees and bunny rabbits. The environment is ideas, the environment is machines, the environment is just the century you live in. To the extent that you think anything is too complicated for you, or too wearisome, it's too boring, I don't want to get involved with that, you become, you tend to be victimized by it. This does not mean that everybody has to know everything, but it certainly suggests that you should know something about most things. A lot of people look at today's huge commercial mass production technology and think it's here, it'll always be here. Well, my feeling is that that's the way the cockroach must have once looked at the dinosaur. He looks up at this thing and he says, oh my God, 
That thing is too big. It'll be with us forever, and the best we can do is just duck. And the same thing, I think, is true of uh, that big technology. It's like a dinosaur. Big tail, swishes around, knocks everything over, but a brain the size of a pea, and it, too, shall pass.